state of FBMAS research uh, panel. Oh, and now we'll just make a small caveat, which is that there's not a person on this panel that I think actually needs an introduction. <laughs> so I got the light lift on, on the moderator intro, which is also good because I forgot my little bio sheet. Um, so uh, we have Dr. Michael Collins. Um, he is globally recognized as a, a leading, if not the leading, expert on FDMAS. Um, he is over at the NIDCR at the NIH, which is one of the institutes at the NIH. Um, and he, for many years, um, was overseeing the National History Study um, at uh, NIH, which is one of the largest cohorts and protocols um, globally and the longest running cohort. Uh, we also have Dr. Mara Rubinucci, two-time winner of the Million Dollar Pie Pride grant. Uh, and uh, also, yes, <laughs> all the way here from Italy, from Rome, Italy. So this is really a treat. Um, and uh, Dr. Minucci's research um, focuses on the biology of FDM um, and uh, focuses on how we might be able to intervene uh, to develop new therapeutics and actually stop it. Uh, we have Dr. Allison Boyce, who is now overseeing the uh, the uh, National Fisher Study at the NIH. Uh, I should say that Dr. Collins and um, Dr. Boyce are both members of our Medical Advisory Council, so they <coughs> help us with, you know, they, they have been instrumental in helping us put this together. Um, they work with us on all of our educational programs, you know, making sure that we can choose the best options. I just have to thank them for their year-round uh, commitment to, uh, to you guys. Everything that we put out of the medical and educational nature they make it possible. Uh, and we also have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Amanda Pirati here with us today. Uh, Dr. Pirati is a sociologist at Loyola, Maryland, and also one of the founding board members of the Pharmacist Social Foundation. She is also currently um, a member of the FDMAS Patient Registry Steering Committee. And finally, we also have Cindy Brown, who is a board member of the Fibrosis Vision Foundation and is the three-year team captain of Team FD. So she actually was the uh, lead volunteer for the 2014 conference, and uh, which she was so energized, honestly, by what she had found there that uh, she turned that into um, you know, being captain of Team FD, which is based uh, up. $300,000 with the help of a lot of fundraisers well. in this room, actually. So, <laughs> yeah. I see a lot of fundraisers in the room as well. So, um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Collins. And I'm hoping that, we, uh, that this reboot has saved us so that we can make sure that we have these slides up here. Um, and otherwise, we thankfully do have the handout. Out, and I hope that that helps. I know that some of those slides are pretty small, um, but thank you for bearing with us, and we'll try and get those up as, as soon as we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, so does everybody have a set of slides that uh, wants a set of slides so you can follow along? All right. So uh, again, I wanted to to thank uh, the organizers and the people who have helped fund this. Um, I just wanted to also say that, you know, coming to these meetings and doing this is one of the most satisfying things that I do as part of my job and my career, so it really is invigorating for me, too. Um, this uh, first slide, <laughs> which I'm seeing, and I hope you guys are looking at on your little thing there. Um, so. You know, maybe for most of you, I didn't even need to put this slide, but it's the slide, Ed, that talks about <laughs> fibrous dysplasia and mccune albright syndrome. And, and I did, part of what I wanted to do, too, was, you know, do a little bit. I, I wanted to try and not use too many medical words, too many jargon, too much jargon, but I did also want to, whenever I could, you know, use some of the words and help, you know, educate you about what they mean so that when you see these things in your reports and you read about them, that they make sense. So what what's... 
interesting about fibrous dysplasia and a little bit different is that it really can affect any part of the skeleton. So it can affect the craniofacial bones, uh, it can affect the spine, which we call the axial skeleton, and it can affect the, the long bones, which we call the, the appendicular skeleton. Um, and not so many bone diseases do all of that. Uh, and what's difficult about this disease also is that the management of the bone disease in each of those parts of the skeleton is, is quite different. And you'll hear later on from Dr. Lindemann and Dr. Stanton how to manage that, but it is uh, another aspect of this disease that makes it particularly challenging. Uh, you know, you need to see different doctors to get the care for these different parts of the skeleton, so, and that makes it challenging as well to find the doctors and to manage all of this. On top of that, that uh, often associated with the fibrous dysplasia is endocrine dysfunction as well. So uh, the, uh, the pituitary can be involved, the gonads can be involved, and, and this further complicates the disease and can have uh, uh, bad effects on the disease as well. So that also may, needs to be managed, and that requires yet another set of doctors. So it's a very complicated uh, disease. So what I'm going to try and do now is, is to break this down to, to where this all derives from uh, and how this disease develops. But then I also too, and I think one of the main uh, purposes of this session and why this session comes first is, is to really uh, tell you about all the progress that has been made since we've started doing this and all the things that are going on now that are, are really right now, we're in a unique place for, for this disease. We're really at a, a position where there's a lot of very exciting things happening and, and I wanted to share that with you. So. So this disease uh, results as, or, or is caused by a mutation in a gene. Uh, so this is a genetic disease. Uh, the gene has the name of GNAS, uh, which we won't go into why it's called GNAS, but, and then the gene codes for a protein, and then the protein is what does the work uh, of the mutation. And the protein is called G-alpha-S or G-S-alpha, uh, has a number of different names, but and then this, this protein, mutations in this protein and dysfunction in this protein is then what causes uh, the problem with the cells. And, and, and Dr. Rimanucci will talk a lot more about that. So the cells that make up the bone or the other tissues uh, and the dysfunction that results in, or is caused in them by the mutation in the gene and the protein. And then it's the, the, um, the dysfunctional cells that lead to a dysfunctional tissue, whether it's the bone or the pituitary um, or the thyroid or whatever. So what this uh, protein does in cells, whether it's a bone cell or a pituitary cell or a thyroid cell or whatever, uh, this G-alpha S is, is kind of like an on and off switch. Um, and you, I'm still speaking loud enough that you can hear me in the back? Okay, good. So this on and off switch really is sort of in many cells sort of a master regulator. And the problem is with this uh, protein in these cells that this on and off switch is stuck on the on position. So if you're a skin cell, you make cafe au lait spots. If you're a uh, cell in the ovary, it causes precocious puberty. If you're a cell in the bone, it causes fibrous dysplasia. So we're, we're, we're fortunate in studying this disease and, and trying to make progress in this disease, that we, that we know the gene, we know the protein, and we're learning the dysfunction of what this protein and this gene does in the various cells. And again, a lot of this about the bone will be talked about later by Dr. Rimanucci, but I have this little cartoon here, uh, which um, <laughs> you guys aren't looking at, but that's okay. Um, so, so uh, and again, this much more will come from Dr. Rimanucci, but I, I think it's okay that there's some redundancy in, in the talks that you'll hear because you, you learn better if you hear things over and over. So the way we think this works is that there's this mutation, this gene, and this protein, and that when this occurs in bone cells and sort of a, a stem cell in the bone, that it induces dysfunction in the stem cell in the bone. So bone stem cells generally give rise to bone cells. They give rise to the... Uh, cartilage cells that make up joints, they give rise to the fat cells that are in bone, and they give rise to the cells in bone that support uh, blood formation, hematopoietic cells. But when you have a mutation in this gene, it, it causes dysfunction in this whole set of, of, of properties or functions that these cells do. 
So they don't make the hematopoietic stem cells. They don't appropriately f support blood formation. Um, they don't uh, function normally in terms of forming normal organized bone that makes bone strong. And so you get, this is what is the underlying cause of the, uh, the disease in fibrous dysplasia. Now, I think that you should have on your slides this cartoon that has the, the little guy in the dark with the, uh, <laughs> the, the title of the slide, Affected Tissues in FDMAS. Or, or so we are, are we on the same page? so to speak. Um, so uh, the way that we think this works is that when there's a, so if, if, if a patient with McCune Albright syndrome, for example, ends up and they have their bone cells affected, their skin cells affected, and their thyroid cells affected. So these cells that give rise to those tissues separated out very, very, very early in development, in fact, in utero. So for you to have, uh, for a patient to have an affected thyroid and skin and bone, the mutation has to have arisen in utero. So yes, this is a genetic disease, but it's not a genetic disease that you got from your parents. Uh, nothing that your parents did, your mother or your father did uh, during pregnancy or before pregnancy that we know of uh, caused this mutation. Uh, it's a sort of bad luck of nature that this occurred. But we do know, or we think anyway, that this mutation has to have occurred very, very early. And this has a lot of implications if this is, is occurred very early, that this sort of happens in utero. So we know then that the, the, the map of the final affected tissues, this map w was charted in utero. So I if we look uh, very carefully, um, early enough in this disease, when, when someone walks through your door at the age of 5, 7, 10, 20, whatever, we can figure out, if we look carefully enough at that time, exactly all of the tissues that are affected. Uh, and this is important because it tells us what we're dealing with, but also it importantly tells us what we don't have to worry about. So if you are in the door at 10 years old and th there's no fibrous dysplasia in your left arm or there's no fibrous dysplasia in your skull, then we know that there will never be. So you don't have to worry about the fibrous dysplasia spreading from one place to another. It really doesn't spread. Uh, if you don't have involvement of the thyroid or the pituitary at the age of 10, you'll never have involvement of the thyroid pituitary at, at the age of 10. So we can figure out what the problems are, what we're dealing with, with pretty early on, uh, based on the fact that this mutation has to have occurred very early in development. The other important part of this, of course, too, is, and this is has been a source of mis misinformation sometimes, is that patients with fibrous dysplasia mucune albright syndrome, although this is a genetic disease, they won't pass this on to their children. So you didn't get this from your parents and you won't give this to your children. So that's an important part. Okay. Um, where we should be uh, on the slides now is this slide that's entitled Onset of manifestation of affected tissues. Got that? We're all there? <laughs> this is the first time I've ever given a talk like this, so it's interesting. <laughs> um, but it's going to work. Um, so um, anyway, so what this, this slide shows is, and actually I think again, I think you're going to see this slide again with Dr. Boyce at some point uh, during the talk. This, um, this slide tells us that, for example, the very top there uh, of fibrous dysplasia. That, that yes, this is established in utero, but when the child is born, you don't see it. It takes a while. It probably takes from, and depending on the, the, the extent of the disease, it might not show up till you're five years old, 10 years old. It might not show up till you're 20 years old. Um, so there's this period of time before the disease occurs. Uh, why does it take that period of time? Well, we really don't know exactly, and again, this is maybe something Dr. Rimanucci will talk more about, but we think it takes a while for you to get enough of these disease cells to really become evident that it's there. Um, and this, we think, is probably the case also with the other tissues. The cafe life spots, if they're there, they seem to be the first thing, so they're sort of there out of the gate. Uh, the precocious puberty happens very early. The other aspects of the disease, the thyroid disease, if you have it, the phosphate uh, problems, these occur later. 
Most of these persist uh, throughout uh, the rest of your life, so these are sort of lifetime issues to deal with. A couple of them uh, go away, become less of an issue. In some patients, the problem with, with the phosphate tends to wane and, and go away with time. Um, the Cushing's disease, which is one of the most rare aspects of this disease, that only occurs in childhood, and if you don't have it in childhood, you'll never have it. Um, but the rest of it, for the most part, persists through adulthood. So in fact, it is something that most of you will be dealing with uh, um, at this point in time for the better part of your life. OK. So the, the, one, the slide that uh, you should be looking at now are called, what are the effects of endocrine dysfunction on FD? And then there's a slide there that shows the effects of uh, problems with phosphate. So the patients with low phosphate and the patients with normal phosphate. And this is just to, one, to show what the problems with phosphate can do uh, to the fibrous dysplasia. Um, and what it shows here is that if you are a patient that has the problem with low blood phosphate, that uh, those patients have uh, more fractures, they have earlier fractures, um, and so the point is that this problem, this endocrine problem, the low phosphate problem, the phosphate wasting problem, impacts on the disease in such a way as to, to make it worse. So, uh, and this is the general issue with most of the other uh, endocrine aspects of this disease, whether it's the thyroid disease or the, the growth hormone. Uh, these problems tend to make the disease worse. So this emphasizes the importance of looking for this early on, to looking for it early on, really at the first time or the first visits when you go to see your doctor to identify whether or not you have this problem, and if you do, uh, to treat it, because not treating it can make the, the, the bone disease worse. Okay. So, uh, the next slide, and I'm not sure what it looks like on your sheet. Can I just take a look at it? Okay, okay. All right. So. The next slide, then, is a slide that cause, says the causes of FDMAS are, are targets for treatment. Ah, thank you. Um, and so th this is really, I, I think, the crux of, of this session here, the importance of this session here, is these things, these causes of FDMAS uh, that we've identified, the gene, the protein, the cells, uh, yes, these are the causes, but for us, as investigators, these are also the targets uh, for our therapy. So it becomes really, really important to understand how this gene mutation works, how this dysfunctional protein works, how these dysfunctional cells work. Because the more we understand about this dysfunction, the better we can target this dysfunction with, with, with therapies. And one of the things I want to say is that this is an extremely exciting time, I think, within the area of fibrous dysplasia because we, we've known about these problems long enough, the gene, the protein, the cells, etc., uh, that we've begun to get a handle on, on how they dysfunction. But the tools for treating these things have really just ad advanced astronomically, uh, number one. Number two uh, is that the pharmaceutical companies, which in the past never had any interest in rare or orphan diseases, now are extremely interested in these diseases. And they have much deeper pockets than the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation, or even in regard to this disease than the government in terms of funding the research. So it's really, really exciting that, that we have this opportunity now. They're very interested. They're very interested in partnering with us. They're very interested in partnering with you. So it's an extremely exciting time. And in regard to the gene treatment, there really are some, some exciting things happening. So, of course, it's in the news all the time about gene therapy. And I have five minutes left that uh, Ms. Cal Ms. Fairchild is, is telling me about. So, okay. So, I'm going to step it up. So, anyway. So, gene therapy. So, gene therapy won't start with fibrous dysplasia. Gene therapy will be worked out in other diseases. And, and the, the progress that's made in other diseases will be applied to fibrous dysplasia. So, so, why don't we just wait? Well, we can't wait. We have to be positioned. We have to be poised to take gene therapy into fibrous dysplasia when the technical problems are worked out with other diseases. What's an exciting therapy, too? And this is a whole new class of drugs that are called oligonucleotide therapy. This is probably one of the latest frontiers in drug therapy where you can actually target uh, the genes and the, the, with, um, 
with small little pieces of DNA and RNA that for reasons that we really don't understand well are, are you can inject them into the blood or take them into the mouth and they're taken up by cells this is a new way a novel way for targeting fibrous dysplasia the protein we have a pretty good handle on and there's a couple investigators around the world who are really invested uh, really first-class uh, investigators Nobel laureates who are invested in trying to find therapies for for the dysfunctional protein the cell therapy, uh, again, I'll probably leave that to Dr. Rimanucci. Maybe she'll talk about that some. She's maybe. <laughs> uh, and then the tissues. The surgical treatments that Dr. Lindemann and Dr. Uh, Stanton will talk about. Better therapies, better instruments, better techniques. We've learned over the years how to, um, how to better treat fibrous dysplasia surgically. We need to get this information out. So the next slide that says uh, targets uh, for treatment and care to promote and improve the quality of life. I mean, improvement in quality of life uh, really is uh, the bottom line of what um, this is all about, right? I mean, we can change the blood phosphate level, and we're real happy if the blood phosphate level goes up as physicians. But if it doesn't improve the quality of your life the way that you feel, and now my screen has gone blank. <laughs> So I can't see that. Okay, so I'll switch over to this. No, it's back. Um, all right, ta-da! All right, good job. So, so I had talked about gene, protein, cells, tissue, but really the other part of that uh, is what's shown here, and all of these are targets as well, and all of these are things that are in play right now, and this is, I think, is sort of the new frontier in this disease. So. Patient organizations, family organizations like this, like the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation, like the FD Warriors, like the Magic Foundation, you guys can have a tremendous impact on this, both in terms of lobbying your legislators for funding, you know, getting the pharmaceutical industry involved. Pharmaceutical industries are extremely more interested in caring for diseases where you have functional, active uh, patient support groups like this one. So they're very important. For, for the first time in, in, in history, within the last years, the physicians and the researchers have recognized that it's important for us to work with you guys, to, to, to put together groups of patients. That where, you know, this small group of patients here, when we multiply this across the international borders and get involved with the, uh, the treatment groups in the UK and, and Italy and France, as we're doing in the international consortium, it really makes a difference and it can really move things forward. As I said, the pharmaceutical industries are much more interested in this, and we've partnered with, with several pharmaceutical companies who are, are interested in, in taking things forward as soon as they're to the right stage. The, the Food and Drug Administration understands much better now that the problems with, with rare diseases and, what's, and that you can apply to the study and, and the care and the approval of a drug for a rare disease the same thing that you can for a common disease. So they're on board with this now. And this will ultimately lead to, to new trials. I, I'm sure of that. Some are in place, and I think Dr. Boyce will talk about this as well. So I wanted to close with, with this little part here. So, so this... So this is what fibrous dysplasia does. This is a, a girl who we've known for a long time, and you can see how she showed up with pretty bad disease at two years old, and this just marched on and marched on and, and really progressed and, and created a lot of problems with her in terms of mobility and function and pain and issues like that. But she is really an amazing, amazing girl, and, and in spite of that, she has led a full, happy, productive life. Uh, this is a picture of her in her high school. She was a member of the cheerleading team. Uh, all that stuff in the background isn't just a prop. That's the stuff that she needed to get to there, uh, but it hasn't slowed her down. So she's, real ama she's really an amazing person. And then you people in this room are amazing people. And this is really an inspiration for us to, uh, to really try and improve things. So what I really wanted to close with is this, is that one day it, the fibrous dysplasia won't have to do that. I really do think that we're at a, in a unique position in, in this disease now, where they're really all the tools and all the stuff and all the people are coming together to, to make real progress. And with that, I'll close and, and thank a few people. I especially wanted to acknowledge Penny Fulian, Arabella Elite, and Paulo Bianco, who were really... Um, Um, I didn't think this was going to be this hard. <laughs> uh, they were uh, colleagues, uh, mentors, um, and uh, they're no longer with us, and uh, 
with that, I'll close. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much and thanks again for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to meet you all and to show you some of our work on fibrous dysplasia. Um, I am a pathologist, so I would like to start by showing you uh, the most uh, uh, typical, important uh, microscopic features of the disease, meaning what happens at affected skeletal sites. Can you guys hear more and then, no. Can you hear you? Okay. <laughs> and then, um, I will make a brief summary of what we have learned from available uh, mouse models and then I would like to conclude by show you, showing you some uh, data on a treatment that we are testing in this, uh, in, in, um, on one of these mouse models. Um, so um, this picture, this is a biopsy, I'm sorry, okay, so on your left is a biopsy of normal bone, sorry, I can touch it, of normal bone and bone marrow uh, showing a regularly distributed trabeculae of lamellar bone, the red stuff, and then you have uh, adipocytes, marrow adipocytes, the white holes, and uh, uh, hematopoietic cells, meaning blood forming cells, the blue stuff within the marrow cavity. So uh, on your right, is what happens in fibrous dysplasia. All these structures are completely replaced by a fibro-osseous tissue, meaning a fibrotic, fibroblast-like marrow uh, within, we, within which newly uh, bone is formed, new bone is formed. However, this tissue is mechanically unsound, it's not functional, because, mainly because the bone inside is not uh, normal and uh, uh, it's not normal for multiple reasons. First, it's not normal because bone trabeculae are irregularly distributed, are irregularly shaped, and the structure is different. It's not lamellar like a normal bone, it's woven bone. Uh, but most important, uh, that bone is not normal because it is hypomineralized and it is abnormally resorbed. Now, we have to... Uh, uh, remind here that bone is a very special tissue for two reasons. The first one is that it is mineralized, it is calcified. It must be calcified in healthy condition. This is a special feature. Only teeth have the same feature, no other tissue in, other, in our body. Uh, the, second, the second point is that bone is programmed to be uh, slowly but continuously destroyed resorbed by osteoclastic cells and regenerated by osteoblastic cells. Now, both these processes, meaning bone calcification and bone resorption, must be precisely regulated. And this regulation is lost in fibrous dysplasia, uh, in the bone, in the, in the pathological bone of fibrous dysplasia. And this is the reason why Fibrous, the fibrous is plastic bone in bone lesions is uh, softer than normal, is more fragile than normal bone. And this explains why it is prone to fractures and deformities, to the clinical expression of the disease. So, um, uh, as Mike mentioned before, skeletal stem cells and the, the family uh, the progeny of skeletal stem cells are very important in this disease because you have to keep in mind that the normal structure, the normal architecture and function of bone and bone marrow is largely dependent on these cells, on the skeletal stem cells and its progeny. The skeletal stem cells resides in the bone marrow cavity. Uh, it generates, plays multiple important functions. As Mike, Mike said, it generates osteoblast, meaning the cells that directly produce bone. It generates marrow adipocytes, and it also regulates um, the, the, the function of osteoclast, meaning bone resorption. And so, um, many years ago, in collaboration with Pam Robe and Mike Collins, we demonstrated that fibrous dysplasia, uh, the fibrodysplastic lesions reflect the abnormal differentiation and function 
of skeletal stem cells and their progeny, meaning of cells in this family. We don't know exactly we, yet which, which, which is responsible, exactly the identity of the cells, but for sure cells in this family are very important. And in fact, we have been able to reproduce the fibro-osseous tissue by transplanting these cells in immuno, into immunocompromised mice. So having, um, we know the gene, uh, we know what happens in the, muta in the um, uh, affected skeletal site. So the next question obviously is how we can cure this disease. Uh, Mike already told you something about manipulation of mutated genes. The other option is the uh, replacement of uh, um, mutated cells, meaning cell therapy. Now, I'm not going to say so much about this today because I think there is some work to do here yet. And this is because, uh, um, because of some features of bone. Uh, keep in mind that cell therapy is easy, quote unquote. Anytime you have a tissue that is rapidly renewing, you can easily replace the mutated cells with normal cells. But bone is, re is renewing very, very slowly. Um, just to give you an example, our blood renews in a few days and our bone renews only three or four times in our life. Okay. So it would be very difficult. To, we need to, to understand how we can accelerate this process first. Then we need to understand how we can remove the fibrosis tissue to leave room for the new bone. So there are many, many aspects that would deserve a long discussion, and I'm not going in, into that in detail today. The other option is to uh, try to understand the mechanisms leading to the tissue changes that I just showed you uh, in order to try to prevent or to revert uh, FD lesions. Obviously, whatever is the research line that we want to follow, we need suitable experimental models of the disease in which we can develop and test these uh, uh, potential approaches. And uh, um, many different uh, transgenic mice, meaning genetically manipulated mice, have been used uh, recently um, to study fibrous dysplasia. Mice that develop fibro-osseous lesions similar to fibrous dysplasia. Some of them have given very good results. I just um, put as, a, as an example one of the last papers uh, published by Mike and other, uh, other scientists. In our lab, we have generated multiple transgenic lines by placing the one of the two mutations causing fibrous dysplasia, meaning the GS alpha R201C, under different cell types. So we have two mouse lines, elongation factor 1 alpha PGK, um, that express the mutation in all cells. Okay? All ce mouse cells express the, mu the causative mutation. Then we have other lines in which the mutation is, for instance, restricted to osteoblasts, meaning to bone cells, or to marrow adipocytes. Okay? Um, and then we have also have other lines, but I'm not going to talk about them, them today. And so we are now using these different mouse models uh, to address two questions. Um, we are particularly interested in these two questions. The first one is, what is the identity of this, the precise identity of the cell types within the skeletal stem cell family that I showed you before, uh, the precise identity of the cells that are responsible for the development of FD lesions. The second question is, um, can we identify and target the most important molecular mechanisms that underlie tissue changes, the tissue changes that I showed you before, so in order to develop, you know, new medical therapies. And obviously to address the first point, the first question, what we are doing is to analyze and compare the different transgenic models that express the mutation in different cell types, okay? And this is what we have learned so far. We have learned that if the mutation is expressed in all cells, in all mouse cells, um, obviously the mouse develop a skeletal and some extraskeletal diseases, mainly endocrine disorders. Um, here, for instance, you can see an example of a thyroid hyperplasia, Leydig cells hyperplasia in testis, 
uh, and most important, the skeletal disease is very similar to human fibrous dysplasia in these mice because um, we can find fibrotic tissue, uh, newly formed pathological bone that is hypomineralized and abnormally resorbed. So these two, the, we have two lines that are very good model, we think, for the disease. Uh, in contrast, mice that express the mutation only in bone forming cells, meaning not in skeletal stem cells, not in the immediate progeny, but in differentiated late cells that produce bone, these mice do not develop fibrous dysplasia. This has been really, really a big surprise for us because we were sure, we were convinced that in order to have a fibrous dysplastic lesion, it was sufficient to express the mutation in bone forming cells. This is not the case, it's much more complex the story. But even more interesting was the fact that, and this is a very recent result, uh, sorry for the quite complicated slides, anyway, uh, the result is that mice that express the mutation in marrow adipocytes, meaning in fat marrow, develop a disease that is very similar to fibrous dysplasia. So this is, I think, very exciting, very interesting. We still have to understand. Uh, now we are, we are focused on these mice. But this strongly suggests that marrow adipocyte may have a role in this disease. And this is in complete agreement with the fact that the disease is completely postnatal. Marrow adipocytes only appear after birth in the postnatal life. And it's also in agreement with the pattern of um, diffusion of, uh, of, um, of ex expression of the disease. So I think this, this is a very exciting uh, research line that we are now following. Um, the second question that we want to, to address is uh, uh, we want to identify the most important molecular mechanisms underlying the, the, um, the tissue changes, I mean underlying justifying the abnormalities of the newly formed bone within a lesion. And obviously, we got focused essentially on the hypomineralization and on the abnormal bone resorption. We are trying to assess what are the molecular mechanisms that lead to these um, two features. So for bone hypomineralization, um, which is also called osteomalacia, it's the same osteomalacia or bone hypomineralization that makes, as I said, uh, bone softer than normal. For uh, bone um, hypomineralization, as Mike mentioned, uh, one molecule has been already identified, is the phosphaturic hormone FGF23. And we need to work on that, obviously. But we also have identified another molecule that could play a role. This molecule is called matrix GLA protein, MGP. MGP is a local inhibitor of bone mineralization, meaning if it is expressed, bone does not mineralize. And in fact, normal osteoblast, normal bone forming cells do not express MGP. Uh, in contrast, it is expressed in uh, mouse skeletal lesion, uh, the brown stuff that is marked by arrows uh, is the, the, mo the molecule that is expressed within the skeletal uh, lesion, whereas the graph down the, in the bottom means that the, the molecule is also expressed in cells that are isolated from the skeletal lesion. But most important, the molecule is also expressed in human fibrous dysplasia. The brown stuff in the last, in the bottom picture means that uh, bone forming cells in fibrous dysplasia produce these molecules that is not normally produced in bone forming cells. So this could be another important molecule to study as a potential target for the disease. As for the abnormal bone resorption, um, uh, let's say that there are different molecules that could be involved. One, for instance, is IL-6. The other one is rank ligand. Rank ligand is a molecule that stimulates osteoclast formation. Osteoclasts are bone resorbing cells. And there are some reports of increased level of expression of rank ligand in human FD patients. And we confirm this in our mice because we can see high levels of expression of this molecule at sites of bone resorption, meaning here, reds, uh, I'm sorry, I cannot, 
Okay. The red stuff are osteoclasts that are developing at sites of bone resorption, and the graphs in the bottom just means that, once again, that this molecule is expressed at high levels, except isolated from lesions. And so, uh, Frank Ligand is, a, is probably the most powerful osteoclastrogenic factor. So, um, and in fact, uh, attempts have already been made in humans to inhibit this factor to block bo the abnormal bone resorption in fibrous dysplasia. We have some papers from Mike and Ellison. We are repeating again, we are testing again this uh, therapeutic, potential therapeutic approach on our mice because we think that mice. Um, can give us some advantages. Uh, they can help us, uh, you know, to in they, they can uh, allow uh, controlled study in a large number of individuals, for sure. They can allow us to assess exactly when we have to, you know, to administer the drug. And most important, this is the part that, for me, it's, it's really the most important, they allow us to perform bone biopsies at different time points after the treatment, something that we cannot do, obviously, with human patient. Not, it's not so easy. So I'm not going into the detail of the treatment that we are doing. I will just, will just say that uh, we are treating uh, young and old animals, meaning two months mice and 12 months old mice. And these animals are treated with either an anti-rank ligand antibody, it's an, al an, um, an analog of the human anti-rank ligand antibody, the nosumab. Uh, some of them are treated with immunoglobulin as a control. It's not a treatment, it's just a control. All mice are have been treated in these experiments twice a week for 14 weeks, and then some of them have been followed up for a few more weeks, up to 26 weeks, okay? And this is the results. Now, um, again, it's quite complex. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but we, we have three panels with, four, with the tail of four mice. The first, mi the first mouse is the control. It did not receive any treatment. The other three mice received the treatment, and the X-ray is taken at different time points. In essence, what we see is that the treatment with the anti-rank ligand antibody induces an increase in bone mass. Okay? There is an increase in bone formation, uh, bone resorption is completely blocked, and what is interesting is that uh, during the treatment we never see new lesions, the appearance of new lesions, and we never see the development of bone uh, deformities. Okay? And the treatment is effective in both um, young and old animals. But what was really surprising, at least for me, is the fact that uh, at histological level, the treatment induced the replacement, the total replacement of the fibrotic tissue with bone. And even more surprising, it's the first, uh, the first two panels are from treated animals. And uh, what is more surprising, and we don't know why yet, is that this bone has, at least in part, a lamellar structure, so this is, I hope I will be able, okay, so, no. Okay, um, on your right, uh, that, that is a biopsy for a treated, from a treated animal, so, the, but the bone that replaces the fibrous tissue is normally, at least in part, in structures, and it is we very well mineralized. Okay, so in other words, to summarize, the treatment Make the replay, induce the replacement of the fibro osseous uh, pathological tissue with bone. The bone is at least in part a normal structure and it, it is absolutely very well calcified. Okay? And so now we need to understand why this happens because this is a very good result. However, to conclude, there is a problem that I need to remark here. The problem has been already observed with human patients. And the problem is that when we discontinue the treatment, uh, after more or less three weeks in mouse, uh, the disease starts again. Okay, bone resorption starts again, and uh, um, bone deformities appears again. 
uh, that's the reason why we are now performing different I mean, other experiments in which we are changing the way of, the, of administration of the drug. We have understood so far that we need a very high initial dose this is very important. And then we need to assess what is the longest interval between two, two treatments that we, uh, we can have. Okay. So this is another research line that we are carrying on. Basically, this was my last slide. Uh, these are all the people that contributed over the years to this, uh, to this uh, study and the, obviously the support from... Um, from you, from Teleton, from our university. And I would like to mention again Paolo and all the other people that are not with us anymore because um, I, I really want to mention its, its uh, uh, commitment, uh, its effort to understand this disease. This disease uh, was for him the, sorry, <laughs> again, the, the central point of his work and of his life. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. So this talk is going to focus primarily on clinical research in fibrous dysplasia, McCune Albright syndrome, and it's really focused on the treatments that um, are either shortly going to be going to trials or are currently in trials. Uh, so, it's, and then I'm also going to close with some of the efforts that we've made to um, establish partnerships with other institutions across the world who study fibrous dysplasia and try to build some of that infrastructure that will let us move forward with clinical research in FD. Um, so for current treatments that are available now. We'll be talking about those in some future lectures coming up. Uh, so I wanted to start by talking about denosumab. And as you saw in the previous talk, this is a drug that actually has called rank ligand. Uh, so this slide really breaks down what the rank ligand pathway does. Uh, so rank ligand is a protein that causes formation of the cells that break down bone called osteoclasts. Um, and the way the pathway on the surface of a bone cell, and it binds to its receptor, which is on an osteoclast precursor, or the cell that is eventually going to turn into the uh, osteoclasts that break bone down. Once rank ligand binds to the receptor, that causes the formation of those osteoclasts, and then you go on to downstream and break down the bone cobbling. So we have a number of reasons to think that rank ligand might play an important role in fibrous dysplasia. So we know that fibrous dysplasia cells in vitro, so essentially in addition a lab, make high levels of rank ligand. Um, and you can see that here, this um, panel on the, the left is a gel, and you can see that the boxes around um, rank ligand showing that the cells that carry the FD mutation make lots of rank ligand, much more compa in comparison to the control cells that don't have the mutation. Um, also the panel on the other screen shows uh, another way, it shows the protein of rank ligand that's being made by the FD cells. Sure, is it not working? Uh, sure. It's not muffled now? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, summing up that we have a lot of reasons in the lab, in addition to think that, fib that rank ligand plays a role in fibrous dysplasia. Um, and we also have evidence in tissue from patients 
that, um, that ray glygan may be an important protein that we should be paying attention to. So these are specimens from, from a patient taken out during surgery, and the brown areas in the panel in the top are staining that lights up where you see ray glygan. Um, and these slides here show that um, if you blow this area up and look at under high power, the rank ligand really seems to be especially expressed around the, um, the giant cells. These are the cells that, tur that break bone down, that play a role in osteoclastogenesis. Uh, so with, and then if we compare staining of rank ligand to staining of another protein, Ki67, uh, this is a protein that lights up when cells are very active. So the main point takeaway from this slide is to show us that rank ligand it is expressed in the fibrous dysplasia tissue, and it especially seems to be expressed in areas that are dividing rapidly and that are very active. Uh, so this makes us question whether or not rank ligand might play a role in, cause in um, the, the um, spreading of FD lesions, the expansion of FD lesions, and all of the activity that, rank, that FD lesions play. Uh, so denosumab, which we've heard some talk of, is a drug that inhibits rank ligand. So it's a monoclonal antibody, meaning it's very, very specific for rank ligand. Um, and it's been approved by the Food and Drug Administration for treatment of adults who have skeletal complications from bone cancers, um, and also in both adults and adolescents for treatment of giant cell tumors of bone. And that's another type of bone lesion that is similar to FD um, in, in its pathogenesis. So this is the same slide that you saw before, and the way denosumab works is it binds to the receptor of rank ligand, and it prevents it from being able to bind to that osteoclast precursor. precursor. So it basically interferes with this entire process and prevents rank ligand from forming activated osteoclasts. Uh, so based on this, uh, this information, we, um, did have, we did perform a compassionate use single exemption study in a little boy with really severe fibrous dysplasia. Uh, so this child had a very unusual lesion in his femur. It was expanding very, very rapidly. It was extremely painful. Um, it led to problems with his mobility. He was unable to move this leg. Um, and it did not respond to surgery. It did not respond to bisphosphonates. Uh, so in this really dire situation, we applied to our, to our institution to make a special exemption to use this drug in an experimental way to try to help this little boy. Um, and it was very, very effective at first. Um, almost immediately after giving the denosumab, his pain resolved. Um, he had been taking multiple doses of narconic medication per day to control this pain, and he was able to stop the medication very quickly, which was, you know, wonderful. Um, also, we saw... Uh, what seemed to be a, a rapid slowing in the expansion of the lesion. So we followed the volume of his femur with CT scans, and the lesion that had been growing very quickly, very uh, shortly after, seemed to very slow in its growth. So that was very exciting. Um, unfortunately, the patient had to stop the medication very quickly, um, and this wasn't something that was done under our supervision. Um, and then he presented pretty shortly to our surprise after stopping the medication um, to the hospital um, with uh, vomiting, pain, and was found to have very high ca levels of calcium in his blood. Um, and this has not been, had not been something that was seen in patients treated with denosumab before. Um, so this graph down here shows how high his calcium levels went. Um, and we found that at the same time his calcium levels were high, his bone activity had gone up very, very quickly. So while he was treated with the denosumab, his bone turnover had gone down very, very low, which is something that you expect to see when you inhibit rake ligand. But after stopping the medication, the bone turnover had increased and it had actually rebounded. It had gone up even higher than it had been before the treatment. And we think that's probably why he developed this high blood calcium level. So this is obviously a very concerning side effect um, that, that we need to understand more about. Um, uh, just another brief, um, uh, a brief slide about this patient's treatment course. So we had obviously been concerned when we're treating a child with a drug that interferes with bone, for, bone formation that um, there may be problems with growth. And that, um, fortunately, is not something we saw in this child. So you can see these are x-rays of the ends of the wrists and the ends of the knees, which are areas where kids grow and where bone turns over very rapidly. 
and there's these thick white bands that you can see forming at those ends, uh, which seem to be related to the treatment of with denosumab. Uh, so inhibiting the bone resorption uh, led, to, led to more dense bone formation at the growth plates. Uh, but fortunately, the patient grew normally, didn't interfere with the shape of his bones, didn't interfere with him getting any taller, and after stopping the drug, these bands went away. So that was reassuring that that, um, that did not seem to be an adverse effect he suffered. Um, so since you know since we treated this patient there's been incre there's been um, additional cases of problems that have happened in patients after stopping denosumab um, so this this rebound in bone turnover doesn't appear to just be related to fibrous dysplasia this rebound after stopping denosumab can be seen in other conditions too so there's now been 10 additional cases of hypercalcemia or high blood calcium that have been reported after stopping denosumab. And this has been in fibrous dysplasia, but in other conditions too, giant cell tumor, Paget's disease, and then also in an adult with osteoporosis. So you see this seems to be more common in children. Nine of the, of the 10 repeated courses were in kids. Um, and this is probably due to the fact that kids have more active bones than adults. But again, we don't really understand um, the implications of this. Um, also, what's concerning is in, in adults who received denosumab for osteoporosis, uh, there's been reported cases of uh, vertebral compression fractures in the spine after stopping denosumab. And this also seems to be related to this very high bone turnover rebound uh, that occurs when you stop the medication. Um, so, you know, I think what this data shows is there really is a lot of potential of deno in denosumab as a as a a way to uh, treat fibrous dysplasia and as a way to change the quality of these bone lesions. But it's something we have to be very, very careful about using. Um, it's not something that I would feel comfortable using off-label outside of the confines of a clinical study, except in very, very rare circumstances. Um, and because of these findings, we are planning to perform a pilot study at the NIH where we will treat adult patients with fibrous dysplasia with a six-month course of, course of denosumab and then have a very, very careful off-drug monitoring phase to understand what happens when the drug is stopped, to monitor patients closely, and, and to make sure that we can stop this medication in a safe and controllable way. Um, so this is uh, the, the study schema. We'll be looking at bone turnover markers, um, and we'll also be following evidence of FD activity on, um, on PET CT scans, as well as bone biopsies. And we're hoping that this will, as a trial, that will start relatively soon. Uh, so one other pathway I wanted to mention for a potential treatment for fibrous dysplasia is um, interleukin-6. Uh, so this is what's called an inflammatory cytokine. Uh, it's a protein that is made by the body in response to either an injury, an infection, a trauma, and it's part of what kicks off the inflammatory cascade. Uh, so similar to rank ligand, we know that if we look at fibrous dysplasia cells in vitro in a dish, those cells make a lot of IL-6. Uh, much more than control cells. Um, and this makes us question what's the possible role of in the inflammatory cascade in fibrous dysplasia. From a clinical standpoint, we don't tend to see a lot of inflammation in fibrous dysplasia patients. We don't tend to see problems with fibrous dysplasia in healing from wounds or fractures, it tends to do very well. Um, however, there are some unanswered questions raised by the, by the increased production of IL-6 in these cells. So tocilizumab is another um, monoclonal antibody treatment, similar to, rank, similar to denosumab. It very inhi specifically inhibits um, IL-6 as its target. Um, and it's been around for a long time. It's been used in a number of conditions, mostly auto autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory diseases um, as a potential treatment. So there's been a few rare case reports of patients with fibrous dysplasia who are treated with tocilizumab who reported a lot of improvement in, in FD-related pain. And right now there's a placebo-controlled trial ongoing in France for treatment of tocilizumab in FD patients. Uh, so this is a study that's designed where half the patients will get tocilizumab and half the patients will get a fake drug that you know, looks like tocilizumab but has no activity. And neither the patients nor the researchers know which patient is getting which drug. Um, and this allows us to really do a very good job of telling uh, what, if the drug is effective or not by comparing the response of those two groups of patients. Uh, so this trial is very close to being done. The preliminary data looks really potentially exciting. Uh, so I do think this is a drug that you'll hopefully be hearing more about that might have some potential use for a treatment of FD. 
Um, so I wanted to close by talking up, uh, by sharing with you some um, updates that we've had in forming an international consortium for studying fibrous dysplasia. So anytime you have a rare disorder like this, it's very important that both the researchers and the patients in multiple centers across the world are cooperative and work together. Uh, because if you divide up a, small, a rare disease into smaller populations, it really can get in the way of performing effective research. Uh, so in 2015, um, we were participated in a master class in fibrous dysplasia that was held in Oxford, England. Um, and this was an event that was planned in, uh, in coordination with the Fibrous Dysplasia Support Society, which is a British-based patient advocacy organization. And they teamed up with uh, clinical researchers in Oxford Musculoskeletal Research Unit. So these were rheumatologists and other doctors and PhDs who, who study fibrous dysplasia. And they plan th this event was funded through a grant from the, uh, from the UK, the NIHR Musculoskeletal Rare Diseases uh, Program. And this is a program that funds uh, organizations to get together and try to build infrastructure to study rare diseases. Uh, so this event was attended by clinicians and researchers from across the world. So the NIH, um, uh, Leiden, which is in the Netherlands, um, Italian researchers in Torino and Florence, uh, French researchers in Lyon, as well as the Oxford group. Um, we also had representatives attending from the UK and of US-based patient advocacy groups. So the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation had a representative in attendance. So the structure of the ma master class re was really designed with the goal of having patients and researchers work together, but also to build in some separate space for each of those groups to, to have discussions among themselves as well. So the first day was completely planned and run by patients. Um, it was focused mainly on uh, support and networking, building relationships between patients and families. Uh, there was a lot of discussion of everyday challenges of living with FD, including um, healthcare access and um, disability issues. And there was also um, an a Q&A with a few invited uh, clinicians who, who were asked to come in and, and speak to the patients in their space. Uh, the second day was fully integrated between patients and clinician researchers, um, and the goal of this was to, day was to review ongoing research activities and really to identify areas of unmet need, to, to understand where we should be focusing our research and what problems we should be trying to solve. The third day was, uh, was just clinicians and researchers, and this included uh, case presentations, discussion of research opportunities. And something that arose out of discussion from all three days was the need, really the need to develop an international set of guidelines to help improve the clinical care we're giving right now to patients. There was a lot of disparity in what type of treatments patients were getting, what type of workup patients were getting. So we felt like our group was really uniquely poised to, to take on that challenge and to develop a set of guidelines that we could then apply you know, universally to help patient outcomes right now. Um, and this was a publication that we put together kind of announcing the formation of the consortium and inviting other people to join. So we had a second meeting in Lyon in November 2016. Um, and attendees included the same core group of clinicians and researchers from the previous meeting. Uh, but what was really exciting at this meeting is we had increasing participation from patient advocacy groups. So we again had representatives from the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation. You can see Lauren Ruotolo's in this picture here below. Um, also groups from the UK, France, and Italy. And the main outcomes from this meeting were we were able to reach con consensus on what we need to diagnose a patient with fibrous dysplasia, McCune-Albright syndrome, which was an area that we had recognized at the previous meeting that was really a source of confusion and an unmet need. Um, we also put together a draft outline for developing the clinical care guidelines. Um, and so this slide really shows the progress that we've made in developing these clinical care guidelines. And where we are right now is here at the bottom. You can see that the draft guideline has been circulated to a wide group of uh, 52 clinicians, researchers, um, patients, and advocates from across the world. And we have an upcoming third international meeting later this month where we anticipate finalizing the guidelines and, and coming up with ways of how to, how to um, spread that, that information. So other ongoing activities from the consortium have included, um, and you may hear some about this later, but there's been a working network of advocacy groups formed 
uh, from between the FD Foundation and um, groups in the UK, Italy, France, and a newly formed group in the Netherlands. On the researcher side, we have collaborated with the Dutch group to put together a, this publication that you'll hear our data about later, looking at the risk of breast cancer in patients with fibrous dysplasia. Uh, so this was really exciting because it included combining the data from our group of patients here in the US and the large group of patients in the Netherlands. So putting those patients together really gave us a lot more power to try to um, understand this problem. So future activities at the upcoming meeting next month is our, our goal is to really expand our global representation from this consortium. And we anticipate attendees from outside of Europe, including South America and um, South Asia. We're going to finalize the clinical care guidelines and, and talk about ways to disseminate that to all the groups that, that are interested and need to hear this. Uh, we plan to engage additional stakeholders, including more translational inve investigators like Dr. Rimanucci, who are, who are uh, working more on the translational and basic research side. And we also want to invest uh, to engage more pharmaceutical um, in industry representatives. Um, we're going to figure out more and better ways to harmonize our data between the different centers and, and also um, plan to build infrastructure for international, hopefully future international clinical trials. Uh, so thanks very much, and I believe we'll be doing questions at the end. Is this loud enough? Okay. Something has happened. Can I make one comment before you start? Say what? I can I make one comment before you start? Sure, but we've got, we've gone to blank here. Okay. Okay, there, we're good. We're back. Uh, just one comment. If you look inside your bags, there's some index cards there. As we go along, if you have questions that you'd like to be asked during the panel session, please write those down on the little index cards. We're going to go ahead and collect those, um, and we're going to mix them with the questions that come in from the digital audience, and that'll be the basis of the Q&A session. So that's what those index cards are for. And if anybody needs an index card, like you, you know, your bag. Um, somehow miss them, just put up one finger and we'll come around and make sure you have some index cards. All right, thank you. All right, well, good morning. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Good, I'll use my teaching voice. Um, hopefully I won't be too loud. Um, my job today is to speak to you about the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation Patient Registry. Um, I want to talk to you about what the can you see this on the top? It's really, really light. Um, what the patient registry is for in terms of our understanding. First, it's to improve our understanding of the disease of FDMAS in the patient population. It's to add to, say, the NIH study and to get data from, say, a monostatic population, not just MAS or polyostatic. It's to bring in the full scope of experiences people have. It's to improve our understanding of diagnosis and treatment. We want to understand what percentage of people who have FDMAS are getting cutting edge treatment. We want to understand are there people with FD who are getting treatments that the research doesn't support. We need to know that so that we can reach out. It is to improve our understanding of the patient experience of illness, how you experience symptoms and your treatment, both personally and socially. We need to recognize that disease affects how people make their way through the world. We need to not just study the bones, but study how you experience having fractures, how you experience having precocious puberty. 
I want to point out that the FDFPR, which is what we call it for short, is the work of patients, it's the work of caregivers, it's the work of researchers and clinicians in collaboration. It was started by a mother who was a nurse involved in research who really wanted there to be more data. And her name was Lisa Harrell. And she started pushing this idea on the, the foundation board. And we got on board with this, literally, and started moving forward. It has been supported by the GR, DR program at NIH. It has been supported by the Pecori Foundation, which stands for Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Initiative. Um, it's been supported in, in part by donations that people have made. Um, let me see. We're moving forward. Okay. Let me tell you about what it is. The, the patient registry is a set of 12 surveys. Completing it does take time. Um, especially if you have many symptoms and if you've received extensive surgical treatment and or medical treatment. It can be completed in stages. You could do one in a day, you could do part of one, you could come back to it. It doesn't have to be done all in one piece. We ask that everyone complete the long process once. We understand that this could ultimately in total take you several hours. But if we can get a baseline it would be amazing. And we promise that in the future, follow-up surveys will be much shorter. So let me tell you a little bit about what those surveys are, those 12 surveys are. Two surveys, I think I passed over one. Let me go back. Document, no. Okay, two surveys document just basic information, demographic information, and information about how you or your child was diagnosed. Then there are four surveys that get at the experience in terms of the symptoms that you have. So this is information about fractures you've had or your child has had, information about puberty, reproductive history, information about endocrine disorders and other symptoms information about pain. So that's, there's two and then four. And this is not responding. Now we're behind. Okay. No. Then there are surveys about treatments received and your satisfaction with them. So a skeletal uh, surgery survey, pain treatment survey, and follow-up questions. Were you satisfied with how this medication affected you? Were you satisfied with the surgery? So we need to understand from the patient perspective how these things are panning out, not just you know, from a clinical objective perspective. And then there are two surveys focusing on quality of life. What is the experience of living with the disease? One is to get at your day-to-day -day needs. How is FDMAS affecting your ability to complete your activities of daily living? How does FDMAS affect your ability to fulfill your social roles? Now, for a child, that might be a social roles might be just simply going to school, playing sports. For an adult, it might be caring for children, holding a job. So we want to get information from patients about how FD affects you at different life stages. That's what this set of surveys gets at. Also, the second one, mental health and well-being. This is about how FD affects you on an emotional level. What are your feelings about yourself, whether or not there's depression, there's anxiety, whether you internalize feelings that you have a negative self-worth. Um, and also how FDMAS affects your social relationships with other people. And from the standpoint of a child, what is the relationship the child has with his peers or her peers at school? Does it impact your relationships with your peers when you're at work and in your neighborhood? So that's the 12 surveys. That's what we're collecting. That's what we're hoping to get a baseline from everybody. So what's the use of all this? 
One, it's going to allow us to explore trends in the patient population. Two, it's going to enable exploration of relationships between specific symptoms and quality of life. Third, it's going to enable clinical effectiveness research um, so that we can look at if we do X, how does it affect quality of life? What does it mean to talk about these trends? So when we're talking about representation of symptoms in the patient population, we can think about which bones are affected by FD, which bones are fracturing, how much pain are patients experiencing, what kinds of pain are patients experiencing across the full spectrum of patients, monostotic, polyostotic, with and without MAS. We can also then look at trends in diagnosis. When is FD being identified? Who is making diagnoses? What kind of training do these people have? Through what means is diagnosis occurring? We can look at trends in treatment. What types of treatments are in use for specific symptoms? How many of them are older treatments? How many of them are cutting edge treatments? We can ask whether demographic qualities of patients determine their access to treatment. That's a critical question we should be thinking about. And what trends in ex are experienced in terms of quality of life? <coughs> what about thinking about the relationship between treatments or between symptoms and quality of life? So we can ask questions about whether the number of bones affected by FD correlate with individuals' quality of life for adults and for kids. This has been explored through the NIH research. We can expand the scope of people with different types of disease that are incorporated into this kind of research. Does the kind of pain experienced and or its intensity and or its location correlate with quality of life? Again, this has been explored through the NIH research data. Does FD in bones of the face and skull affect quality of life differently? than bones in other parts of the skeleton. Again, for adults and for children. And then we can be, oop, we went too far. We can investigate clinical effectiveness. Does a particular treatment improve the quality of life of a patient? Or we can look at, say, two treatments, rods versus uh Plates. We can uh, explore whether medicine X or medicine Y seems to produce a better outcome in terms of quality of life. We can ask questions about whether surgery is important in craniofacial or whether we should pursue watchful waiting. But let's get back to the patient registry. This is what we have in the patient registry right now. We have 538 people who have input their, at least their name and some basic contact information. That is amazing. However, 238 people of that 538 have actually given us surveys. We have 75 people who have completed all the surveys. So we're getting started but we're nowhere near where we need to be if we want to do the kind of research that this tool can allow us to do. What do we know about who is currently in the registry? As you can see, we have a fairly good representation of ages across the spectrum. And of course, when we're looking at 0 to 9 and even 10 to 19, we have parents inputting data about children. But when we're looking at 20 up to 69, we're looking at people inputting for themselves. We know that we have mostly people from the US, but we do have people represented across a wide range of countries, Canada being second. This is our racial ethnic representation. Now, there is no reason to believe that FD is affected by a 
genetic mutation that discriminates on the basis of race or ethnicity. Therefore, we should expect this to uh, be represented across the population. If we have lower levels of participation by people who are non-white, then we need to be reaching out. We need to be increasing the diversity of our sample. Same thing here. We have 79% of our current participants are women. 21% are men. We have no reason to believe that this disease discriminates on the basis of gender. We need men to participate in the registry. At present, this is the representation we have on the basis of type of disease. We have monostatic cases. That's a good representation because they might not be picked up in the NIH study. Um, but we need everybody of all kinds of symptomology to participate. Um, and currently, these are the most commonly affected bones that are represented in the registry. So we have um, higher levels of people with craniofacial, and that in part is because we've been doing some active recruitment of people into the registry who have craniofacial. Um, but we need, you have it in your spine, you have it in your arm, you have it in your leg. Please participate. So what's next? is figuring out how to use this data. So I will tell you right now that planning is underway for a clinical effectiveness study concerning FD in the face, skull, and skull base. This is work that is being done by Dr. Andrea Burke, who is at the University of Washington and has not made it here yet. Uh, yep. <laughs> Myself. Um, I'm a sociologist. Uh, I work at Loyola University, Maryland. Um, I have been involved with the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation since 2004, um, and I work with Lisa Harrell in trying to get this registry going. I see it as a vital tool, so I want to start using the data. Um, Tova Burstein over here is coordinating this project, and Samantha Scott is a senior at Loyola University of Maryland, and she is um, helping us get this thing going. And. Um, the question that we're pursuing is whether surgery produces better quality of life outcomes for individuals with craniofacial FD um, as opposed to doing nothing and waiting and watchfully monitoring the disease. Um, so we can ask, do, do CFD patients who receive surgery have better physical functioning? The registry will allow us to explore that. Less frequent pain, less intense pain, thank you. Uh, fewer emotional difficulties, and better social functioning. So this is, at this point, an invitation to you to participate out there. Those of you who have uh, cranial facial FD, um, try and get yourself onto the registry and log yourself in and start completing surveys. Now you may ask, there are 12 surveys, do I have to do all? No. You don't. Not first. We'd like you to get them all done. But to participate in this study, we need you to do the ones at the top. We need you to complete the basic information, information about skeletal surgeries, information about your pay level, your mental health and well-being, and your day-to-day -day needs. And we can move forward with that. All the rest we'd like you to get to. So I ask, can we develop a research culture? Everyone with rare disease benefits when individual patients put their information together. We can understand our disease better, we're able to improve treatment, and we will do a better job of making it possible for more people to live well with this disease. The patient registry is only as good a tool as we make it. Numbers matter. The quantity of data matters. The quality of data matters. If we can get 538 complete data sets, we, can, we are poised to answer so much. Your input is needed. And now I'm going to shift to a slightly different plug here. Is that in, in addition to the patient registry, there are other ways that you can participate in research. 
Since last year, I have been doing qualitative study involving face-to-face -face interviews with people with craniofacial FD. A uh, couple of people in the audience here I have spoken to. More than a couple, actually. Um, and I encourage you, if you are interested, if you're over 20 years old, you comfortably speak English and can converse in English, um, and you have FD in your face, your skull, or your skull base, I encourage you to contact me uh, by email, A-K-O-N-R-A-D-I at Loyola.edu, and subject line, CFD study. I'd be happy to talk to you about this. Um, I have people who are participating from outside the United States. If we can't meet face-to-face, -face, we do it by Skype, we do it by FaceTime. Um, I want as diverse a sample as I can. And I thank you very much for being here today, both online and in your presence. Here. I'm technologically challenged, so. Okay, great. This is the one you have, and this is just next. Excellent. Good morning, everyone. So, I am humbled to be sitting alongside this panel of researchers. Um, I'm sure all of you share in my thanks for their passion and their dedication to our cause. Um, without them, we would not be here today. I also want to thank Deanna, who wears so many hats in the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation and on the research committee in particular, she is invaluable. So thank you so much and for helping me with this monitor as well. Um, so you don't have to be a scientist or a researcher <coughs> to know what the understanding of our disease goal is. And our ultimate goal here is find better treatments and ultimately a cure for our patient community. So how do we try to achieve this monumental goal with the limited resources that we have? We're a small, we are a disease organization. We rely on individual contributions. We have some corporate contributions. And over the last three years, we have steered approximately $150,000 towards different uh, research goals. So how do we figure out what the strategy is for steering our research when we don't have millions of dollars every year to steer? So we've developed a three-pronged strategy. Uh, the first one is to identify the most impactful research. Uh, we've started by recruiting a scientific advisory council of bone research all-stars. One is Mike Collins, who's sitting here. Our chair is David Burr. He's the associate uh, vice chancellor of research at uh, Indiana University. We also have on the team a, um, one of the scientists who discovered the FDMAS gene and several other prominent scientists and researchers. We've also surveyed patients, identifying their priorities, and no surprises here for everyone. Um, these uh, surveys have showed pain is one of the most prominent issues of patients, halting the progression of the disease and stopping regrowth. Um, we've used the registry, which is so important. You're going to hear so much about this at this conference to get this information, as well as Facebook. And we also have surveyed our researchers and clinicians on the gaps to progress. We have 239 doctors and clinicians on our email list, and they're telling us what we need to get to the next level of research, um, a robust registry, which is so important, 
sharing mouse models. You heard Dr. Rimanucci talk about the testing that's being done. We need to make sure that these mice are shared by all of the different institutions all over the world. So anytime a researcher has a new idea, they can test it on these mice. And then donating bone samples, that's another big issue. Um, when people have surgeries right now, there's not a protocol where the surgeons know where it goes, how to preserve it, where it should be sent. And these, this is what the researchers need to test these different uh, therapies on. So this is how we've identified the most impactful research. The second strategy is to create a village. And you've heard a lot about that from our former speakers. Um, we're bringing together researchers, patients, companies, universities, hospitals, lobbyists, and government agencies. Um, the first is working with the patient groups all over the world. We're a rare disease. So as uh, Dr. Boyce said, we need to have as much input from the global community and not just the community here in the U.S. Um, we sponsored the first international scientific conference right here in Maryland in 2010. And now we have FD board members attending uh, conferences all over Europe. And uh, we're assisting Dr. Collins right now in uh, forming this International Alliance of Researchers, which is going to be the 2019 Scientific Conference. We, as a board, are committed to engaging in federal advocacy to preserve NIH resources, which are so important. And you will have another panel about this discussion um, on, on the government's needs. And then finally, incentivizing and educating pharma companies and hospitals all across the country uh, about this disease. Um, these these uh, pharmaceutical companies need to know, and they're finding out a lot more over the past few years about our disease and what's needed to make it better. And one thing that I am very passionate about, I'm sure a lot of you here, is getting centers of excellence across the world so that you don't go to a doctor that's telling you there's no pain in FD or just graft it or you'll outgrow it in puberty. All of us know this isn't true and you have doctors that are still stating this and these are from prominent institutions because there's no protocol out there. There's no uh, wealth of information that's shared amongst the institutions. So that's, that's a very big goal of ours. And the third prong of the strategy is to fund more research, obviously. Uh, we've heard the strides and momentum that were made by all of these researchers here. But we need to get to the next level and fund more additional innovative research. And that's the reason I'm here today. Um, when uh, in 2007, 10 years ago, which I'll never forget the day we found out when my daughter was diagnosed, she was 13 years old and she broke her hip. And we were devastated. She was devastated. Um, but what was more discouraging was I researched obsessively, never heard of this disease. And all I kept reading about, there's limited options, limited treatments, uh, surgery. She's going to have a lifetime of surgery. She's going on her fifth surgery next week. And I was devastated by the fact that I could not do more to try to uh, bring about a resolution of this disease. Uh, fast forward to the patient and family conference, which uh, because of the Fibrous Dysplasia Foundation that I had sought all of my information and Charlie Harles is here who started the institution and I had corresponded with him, how can I help this foundation? And I came to the conference just wanting to learn more, meet more people and, and, and help with regard to all of the issues we faced, not thinking that I was going to hear there really are prospects to ultimately reach our goal of better treatments and a cure. And I heard Dr. Roby from NIH and Dr. Collins speak. And I left that conference thinking, we have got to get more research somewhere. It can't just be the NIH. And I scoured the internet and made numerous calls. And I finally discovered UPenn had this orphan disease center. And they had just the prior year sponsored what was called the million dollar bike ride for rare diseases. There's 7,000 rare diseases and they sponsor 20 each year and they match dollar for dollar up to an additional $50,000 towards research. And after you have this ride and you raise your money, they then send out proposals for 
each individual research, research team, um, asking them to come up with unique ways that they can conquer, conquer these diseases or achieve the goals of these diseases. And that, that's what happened. These past three years, we have raised over $300,000 for uh, fibrous dysplasia research. And I have been fortunate as the captain of the team to read all these grants that come in, all of these grant applications. There have been 21 over the past uh, three years. Only five have been awarded to, to Dr. Rimanucci. We're waiting to hear about the 2017 winners. We'll find out next month. But these, these applications are exciting. They are people that are looking to cure fibrous dysplasia, find targets for therapy. Uh, polio was cured by mouse model testing. Uh, Herceptin, which is a, a drug used for cancer. These are the ways we're going to get, get to the next level and reach our goal. So, so we need people to get involved in the million dollar bike ride, especially because it became so popular that next year's ride is just a lottery. We made the lottery. All of these rare diseases now, they're going to pick out of a hat and decide which 20 diseases are going to be in the future rides. So this ride, we need people to participate. It doesn't mean coming to the ride. We only have, we had seven teams here. Only two of our teams were at the ride. And I see a lot of people who fundraise that are in this audience here. We need to get everyone involved. We're going to get matching to matching funds again, up to $50,000. These exciting research grants will be read. And hopefully, we can get five or seven researchers or eight researchers. If we can triple the number of teams here, we can triple the number of um, applications that are um, come from across the world. So I hope you all can help. And if you come up with other ideas, something like the Million Dollar Bike Ride or another place or institution, we would love to, on the research committee, have you and have your input. And finally, uh, I just want to say that we're all the heart of the village here, the patient community. And we can make it happen and find, find, find better treatments. And ultimately, we will get a cure. Thank you. All right, we are now entering the Q&A portion of this panel. Um, Samantha is going to be going on part questions that you have. Um, we already have a lot of questions from the digital audience, so um, bring them in, and we're trying to merge them together to make sense of the answer those popular questions. Um, and of course, the questions that neither of you can be answered during this panel. Mike, you could start us off here. Uh, why do you think it is that pharma is finally interested in the disease of FDMAS? Or in particular, FDMAS? Okay. Yeah, that this one? This is uh. And the question was, why now? Why is it finally happening that there is interest from pharmaceutical companies, from biotechs, into looking into specifically FDMAS? So it's a good question, and I'm not sure that I really am the best qualified to answer the question, but I can give you what I think is that, and I think it's several things. I think, first of all, I, I think that the science has advanced so much that we now know the molecular cellular pathology that we understand these things are about. So we've identified the targets and we've gotten the techniques so the technology has advanced, the understanding has advanced. I think also too it's what's been a big factor and I don't understand this well. I mean pharmaceutical companies at the end of the day have to make money, right? So I think that the model models have changed. They've recognized that, you know, they can't 
create one big blockbuster drug after another. And there's been famous examples of blockbuster drugs that have gone down in flames and they've lost, you know, billions of dollars. So I think it's a new model. They recognize that that there's all these untreated patients. You put together all these rare diseases, and it's a lot of patients. And so this is how they do that. Of, of understanding so much more about the different specific genes and what they do is that there's been a lot of interest in what you may have heard as personalized medicine. Uh, so I think a lot of the, uh, 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 on the whole, the field is moving towards trying to identify ways we can treat patients very individually. And, you know, the end goal is, is more to treat probably, you know, diseases like diabetes, cancer, diseases that affect large amounts of people. But I do researchers in general are recognizing that rare diseases are an opportunity because in rare diseases a huge effect. So if we can understand more about how to identify and treat the, that one gene, then we can treat uh, diseases that result from a lot of different genes that have small effects, like, you know, like diabetes. Someone noticed there was a connection between the presentation that Dr. Boyce gave and that Dr. Minucci gave, and that sort of uh, convergence is about rankle in intervention. So, uh, Dr. Minucci, do you think uh, that there's lessons that to be learned what we're seeing in the clinic from the denosumab case study? on the work that you're doing clinically, um, and uh, just more broadly, how should someone who uh, is watching and doing this year uh, think about the relationship between the uh, anti-rancor, the rancor inhibition work that you're doing, um, and the repurposing work that's happening with the denosumab clinical trial? Okay. So about the first point, so you, have, you, have, you have to speak last. Okay. So about the first point, well, what is the lesson? Okay. Yeah. You can just hear better. So okay. Is that okay? Okay. Um, okay. About the first point, well, it was what is the lesson that we can. Uh, learn, um, okay. I think that from the uh, biological and pathogenetical point of view, uh, the lesson is that there must be, uh, at least in my opinion, the hypothesis is that uh, it's not only a matter of uh, blocking bone resorption. I mean, there is something else in this treatment um, that need, needs to be understood. I mean, I don't know at this point if it just uh, rank ligand inhibition, or if it is osteoclast um, formation that is blocked. Uh, but that's for sure what we see is something, there is something more compared to what we can see with, with for instance, bisphosphonate. Bisphosphonate just stop the activity of osteoclast, and we have some time of morphological tissue changes. Whereas rank ligand block blocks the formation mm -hmm. of osteoclasts, and we have some different tissue changes. So I think that we still have to investigate this, this treatment. There is a lot that we need to learn. Um, about the second point, how can this study go, go in studies go in parallel? I think that they must be, they must go in parallel because. Um, in human studies on human patients can give us some kind of information, but as I said before, uh, there are some other basic essential information that can come more easily, not only from mice, but more easily from mice. For instance, what is happening at histological levels at different time points. So I think it, would be, it is very important, you know, to go side by side. This next question um, is a mix between in-person and digital, uh, and I, I'm going to direct it toward Allison. So um, the question we got from the in-person audience is, 
which pharma companies are involved in the current clinical trials. Um, and um, a question from the digital audience, what are the challenges and barriers in general to kind of these, you know, repurposing studies, you know? So I think someone noted that in 2014, the, it seemed like we were in a similar point with regards to the denozumab trial. So um, when we're working with companies that already have brought these drugs to market for other diseases, what what's between us and the information then? You know, what, what, why, what, what are the barriers there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the denosumab is, is made and licensed by Amgen, and they have um, agreed to partially support the denosumab trial that we're planning at NIH by providing drug. Um, one of the biggest barriers, um, I, I think, to conducting these types of research really is cost. Denosumab is incredibly expensive. In the U.S., it is about $1,000 a dose, and it's just prohibitively expensive uh, to do a trial like that without some type of support. Uh, from a pharma company. Um, you know, government, in, in, traditionally, biomedical research in the U.S. has been funded through the government, and um, the government funding just does not, is not sufficient <coughs> to provide, to purchase drug at that type of cost in order to perform a study. So we've got to far partner with pharma. It's really crucial. Um, but there's a lot of challenges inherent to par partnering with pharma, and a lot of it is driven by what are the goals of the pharmaceutical company. You know, I think here in this room, we all share a lot of the same goals. You know, we want to improve quality of life for patients. We want to treat the disease. Uh, you know, pharma is is really profit driven, um, and it's particularly challenging when you have a drug like denosumab, which was originally developed and marketed for a very common disease like osteoporosis or bone metastases. You know, that's where Amgen's going to get the biggest bang for their buck, uh, and then that's where they can really you know generate enough revenue to justify developing the drug in the first place. Um, so one of the challenges in repurposing them for other conditions like fibrous dysplasia is, you know, they can potentially there's real risk involved for them. You know, if, if we identify side effects or, or dangers in using this drug, that can jeopardize their ability to use it for these more common conditions. Um, and, you know, they have to weigh those risks, in, the risks of that with the benefits of being able to, you know, use this drug to treat a pretty small population of patients. Uh, so part of partnering with pharma is really trying to identify our shared common ground and figuring out how we can we can all work together to reach their goals while still maintaining their interests in mind. So does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This next question is for Dr. Kunrati. Um, where and how is patient registry data stored in the fabulous days of multiple security breaches? Hmm. And is there an anonymized version of the patient registry that other patients can read? Well, the, the platform for the registry is the National Organization for Rare Disorders. There is a contract between the FD Foundation and the uh, and NORD, as we say, uh, about informing if there's any breach. Uh, it will occur immediately, and then we will inform, the foundation would inform all people who are currently in the registry. Uh, we don't foresee that happening, uh, but the, those protocols were, were established before the development of the registry. The registry is overseen by an institutional review board, an IRB. Um, all the surveys have been reviewed by experts. Uh, the protocols for sharing data have been reviewed by experts. Um, they can tell us that we can't do things. Um, there's an understanding. Second part of your question was? Is there an anonymized version yes. of the patient registry that other patients can read? That other patients can read. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, at the end of putting your data in, there is um, an aggregation mechanism <coughs> uh, that you can see as the totals are accumulating. But again, remember, you're seeing totals of, of various numbers. There are only 75 people for which you're going to see all the data. There are going to be some people who did this survey, say 100 did this, 200 did that. So it's not consistent across. Again, that's why we need people to complete this. Um, but I want to also speak to anonymized data. Researchers who are interested in pursuing CER questions or anything else can come to the foundation and can ask for access to anonymized data to determine whether it would be useful for them to pursue a study. Um, that is, again, you could send an info at fibrousdysplasia.org uh, message to the foundation and somebody will get back to you to explore those issues. 
Great. And this is a, a question I think it'd be in interesting to hear everyone's perspective on the panel. Uh, so we'll start with Cindy and then we'll go down the line. Um, how can we bring other countries, other researchers, other institutions to the international consortium? How can we think about that? How should we, you know, um, what should our top priorities be? What are some of the uh, things that we need to do to achieve our goals um, with regards to convening the international community um, around the international consortium? Uh, I see um, social media, Facebook, those seem to be the binding uh, factors that bring, bring about a lot of international interest. Um, while we do have ways as a foundation to reach out to different researchers and doctors, and we do reach out as much as we can, I think as a community, if we are more a loud voice through social media, um, it will get around that we are a force and a force that needs to be um, recognized in the international community. So I know the researchers have their own resources and, and ways, ways to get around, but I think all of us here, since we are not connected with, with different doctors except for the ones that we have a personal relationship with, I think we can uh, use our voices throughout the internet to, to get our, our cause known and get the researchers more interested in our disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so speaking from a, a researcher perspective, you know, what, what motivates a lot of, of researchers is in the ability to be productive, you know, so that they want to, you know, and they want to make discoveries, they want to publish, they want to have, uh, have findings that will help patients. So I think the opportunity to collaborate with other researchers, especially ones that have large data sets, can help them um, kind of synergize the data and make observations that they wouldn't be able to do by themselves. Uh, so, so from our end, we've been really trying to, to, to put out there that we're willing to collaborate, that we want to collaborate, and um, publications like the breast cancer paper that recently came out, I think, can, can really help get that word out and, and draw in more researchers to the group. Um, I guess one of the big things is that uh, investigators need to be incentivized to collaborate. Um, science by its nature is, is in some ways historically has been more of a competition than a collaboration. Uh, and you know who gets the first paper gets the prize. Uh, and I think things are changing and I think um, things like it are being done here that incentivize investigators to work together uh, are wonderful. The other thing is, you know, we've been super fortunate at the NIH that the, the federal government, that the taxpayers have funded this study for a long time, uh, and that's great, but, you know, that's not the case with researchers all over the, of the world, and, and they're struggling, and it's very hard, and they can't do the research without funding, and, and so that's the incentive to, to get them to collaborate. <coughs> yeah, I mean, um, I think that uh, certainly collaboration, and I mean, it, it's a very important point. Uh, as Mike said, uh, we must collaborate rather than being in competition. Although, although I have to admit that, uh, um, I mean, then when you have to ask for funding, okay, I mean, if we do not change the funding system, mm -hmm. It's very difficult. I mean, you need the credit for something. Otherwise, they won't trust you. They won't give you money. So there is a big gap that we have to, you know, to fill here. Um, second point is certainly is funding. The third point, in my opinion, is that uh, the con any consortium must have very clear goals. Uh, you know, um, how can I say a hierarchy? Hierarchy of very cl clear goals that can be feasible. Step by step, one after the other. I mean, that's another, I, I think, very important point for patients, but also for research, okay? So uh, having the idea that, you know, you will go gradually um, across goals that can be reached step by step. Um, from my perspective, I think one of the issues of collaboration <coughs> is bringing together um, unexpected people, a sociologist, a craniofacial surgeon a psychologist with somebody who treats pain, 
Um, these are ways that we can broaden our understanding. It's also vital that we involve patients in our research and helping us think through what kind of things to measure. Um, that's why with Dr. Burke, we're, we've got a team of patient collaborators to help us figure out what to study. All right, so uh, Dr. Minucci, I think as the you know, two-time winner of the Million Dollar Bike Ride uh, grants, there's, there's some fans of your work in the digital audience, and we have uh, two follow-up questions specifically about your research. Um, first is, when will your uh, most recent studies be published? So the uh, papers that we just, you know, the, the research we just saw, I think um, the folks who, who could follow along with the, <laughs> yeah, with what we were looking at, I mean, that was thrilling. That was thrilling, uh, truly, um, the work they've done there. So when are you, what's your timeline for publishing, and um, do you still need bone samples? Okay, so about the, the manuscripts, we are preparing all the manuscripts. Uh, uh, the first one will be the one about rank ligand. Uh, we are almost, I mean, we are getting there, so I think we will submit it very soon. And then we will submit manuscript about the other mouse models. Although, I mean, you have to understand that to, in order to publish a mouse model, it must be characterized very, very well. Otherwise, there are no journal that can accept just, you know, a simple description. Um, so the order will be first the anti-rank ligand experiments work, and then the other, the new mouse models. What was the other question? There was another. Do you still need bone? Oh yes, yes, yes. So would you bone. repeat the question just so that everybody can hear? Yes, we still need bone samples because for you know for a while we did not work so much on samples for tissue samples from patients, but now it's because we were really focused on our mouse model, trying to understand if they were valuable or not. But now certainly we need to go back and to make a comparison between mouse tissues and human tissues. Thank you. This is going to be our final question for the research panel. So thank you so much for your time and these thank fascinating you. presentations. Um, you know, the FD and MAS, it, the patient community is really first, you know, in terms of where they're affected and how they're affected. Um, so I think uh, a lot of the patients in the audience, digitally and in person, are maybe thinking, but will will this help my kind of FD? Will you know, the treatments under discussion, the, the theoretical treatments under discussion, will, are they more likely to help, you know, a person with craniofacial FD or, you know, uh, FD in their axial skeleton? Or um, is it likely that this is going to address the MAS issue? So um, I, I know that that's uh, because of the just diversity of different kinds of patients out there and also the diversity of different treatments, that's a hard answer to give a, a sort of blanket answer to, but could you help the audience understand a little bit about the general like geography of uh, you know, the intersection of different kinds of phenotypes, of different types of presentations of the disease, um, and whether or not that has any bearing on how they should understand how these, whether these treatments might be able to help them. And another element that might be interesting to address there is the age factor. So, you know, pediatric patients versus um, folks who are already adults. Let me answer that. <laughs> Let's start. <laughs> okay. No, no, it's a great question. I, I think it, it, it depends sort of what, on what level of research you're speaking to. Uh, so we know that the patients present in very, very diverse ways. No two patients look alike. We have patients who are very mi minorly affected and then patients who are very severely affected. Um, and when we're looking at mechanistic studies uh, and translational studies, uh, we know that one thing that unites, you know, all patients across the board is that the pathophysiology of the lesions themselves are probably similar. Um, so there's the gene mutation that causes fibrous dysplasia is, you know, very similar in patients dis regardless of their severity of their disease. So these type of translational studies, I think, look, are likely to be pretty generalizable. Uh, when we look at clinical research, so clinical interventions themselves, uh, that may vary more depending on the patient's presentation. Um, so interventions such as surgery vary quite a bit about what location you're talking about. You know, even within one leg bone, if you're talking about a weight-bearing bone like the, the angle of the femoral neck versus the tibia down farther on the bone, you know, there's, you approach those very, very differently uh, with a surgical intervention. Um, 
And, you know, we do know that endocrinopathies can have different effects on fibrous dysplasia. So, you know, patients who have McCune-Albright syndrome may respond differently to treatments than patients, who, than patients without McCune-Albright syndrome. Uh, so really at the, at the most basic level, you know, our hope is that if we can, if we can intervene mechanistically in the pathophysiology of the disease itself and start, stop the lesions from forming or becoming severe, that will hopefully be pretty generalizable. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, one of the things I wanted to say is this is a, a very difficult disease. Uh, it, 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 it's rare, number one. Two, it's not a genetic disease, so it's not transmitted. So when you find one patient, you find one patient, you don't have a family. It's this somatic mosaic disease, so patients are extremely different. Um, and and that poses a real challenge. So when you see this patient, there's a one approach is, is, is this, another patient, the other approach is this. And, you know, in, in doctor's defense, you know, they may have seen one or two patients in their training, and, and then a patient shows up, oh, I know how to take care of this patient, but they may not really because it's so completely different. So one of the efforts that has we, we've done for this, and I think, is Allison put together, Dr. Boyce put together a paper in, in, a, in, a, in a journal called Gene Reviews. It's, it's online, it's free, it's public domain, and it's a collection of, of algorithms that it addresses every part of this. And in those algorithms, it also addresses the spectrum of the disease. So I think this is the closest to, you know, a how-to-do-it chart that, that any doctor could have. So I think it represents a, a really nice tool today uh, that that uh, a doctor uh, could use, and it, it's it's fine for you to take this and hand it to your doctor and say, I think this might be helpful mm -hmm. to you. Uh, <laughs> if if they're not receptive to that, then maybe you should find a different doctor. Uh, but but it, it is difficult. It is difficult. And in the doctor's defense, you know, the, you know, they may see one or two cases of this, and and the time that it takes to invest in this, and, and these doctors nowadays are squeezed. You know, you've got 15 minutes, and and they're going to read a paper and do this and all. I mean, it, it's hard. It really is hard. But they c they can do it with your help and your prodding. I think. Fantastic. Uh, thank you all again for your participation on this panel and your wonderful presentations. Um, we are going to go on a short break. Uh, we are going to go on a short break right now. So um, please stretch your legs, greet your neighbors. Um, we're going to be switching out uh, the breakfast really shortly. So if you haven't availed yourself of the big good.